Good evening, Australia. Welcome to the show. I'm Michael Kazilny, and I uh, hope you're having a lovely Wednesday night. Thank you for tuning in every Wednesday for the last uh, few years. I know there's a lot of regular watchers. And, and of course, the show started um, back in 2004. Uh, it used to be co called Cops and Lawyers. Then it progressed, of course, to a life in crime. But uh, in recent times, tough times, so we can get a broader audience to come along. And the reason behind the show, as you all know, I've, I've spent the last 25 years in the criminal justice system and have just realised uh, that so many people go through some tough times, whether it's uh, uh, financial problems and bankruptcy, whether people suffer from cancer, lose a loved one, uh, the relationship problems, uh, depression and suicide. On tonight's show, I've got a very amazing man, David Webb. He's got a PhD on suicide, but the interesting thing is uh, he's tried to kill himself a few times uh, himself. So he's certainly got the uh, experience. Thanks for coming on, David. Thanks, Mike. God bless you, my friend. Uh, what an amazing person you are, because most people uh, are very close books, aren't they? they? They don't want to share the truth. It's, it's a very pretentious society. But here's a man who had an urge to die, you say, in your book. Mm -hmm. Where did that urge come from? I still can't say for sure exactly where it come from, came from. I can't point to anything specific um, that, that, that explains it adequately. I mean, I've met other people that can, they can talk about some childhood traumatic experiences or whatever. Um, I can't point to anything, which in fact makes it more difficult sometimes. Cause David, you're a beautiful human being. Tell me where the journey started, uh, and because there's, there was also a, a heroin addiction along the way, uh, but now you're a university professor. I mean, uh, tell the viewers, where did it all start? You grew up in Australia? Well, I'm not a university professor. I've done a PhD, and I'm an unemployed academic, but it's okay. <laughs> you're uh, a very smart man, though, and I'll a very kind-hearted man. <laughs> Thank you. You grew up in Melbourne? I grew up in Melbourne, um, uh, completed school here, uh, uh, travelled a bit, went to university, dropped out. Um, Travelled a bit and some more, worked and then found myself in England in 1979 mm -hmm. and broke up with my girlfriend at the time and uh, everything just sort of collapsed for me and next thing you know um, I was feeling pretty suicidal and in, on that occasion, back in 1979, I didn't really think about it too much, I just went and did it. How old were you then David? 24. 24 living in uh, the UK, yep. how did you try to do it? Heroin overdose, and it's uh, at, at that attempt. That's where I picked up these burns, and I say the fire was an accident, but the overdose was deliberate. And I woke up a couple of days later. Oh, I in, missed, in I missed that on that. So, what had happened? You took, uh, you, you tell me that you shot some heroin, mm. a, a hot shot, or no, no, no. I, I um, got as much as I could and pumped it into myself with a very deliberate intent, and. Um, so, uh, Inadvertently, it appears, knocked over the little bedside candle that I had, and um, the neighbours the next morning saw puffs of smoke coming out the window. I uh, woke up my, um, my friends that I lived with, they came in and there I was, and they called an ambulance, and I woke up a couple of days later. David, were you addicted to drugs for many years before that? No, I, my heroin use had just been um, sort of recreational, it was, and, and sort of social, it was, it was not a big deal, I was always too busy doing anything. So I, I didn't really get caught up with it in a big way uh, back in those days. So you had the urge to die. Were you uh, depressed? I don't like that word depressed because it's associated with this um, notion that depression is a medical illness, which I don't accept um, because there's no evidence to support that. Um, in fact, I used to say to my GP when he asked me, you know, when did I start feeling depressed? And I said, stop being lazy in using that word you know if you think I'm feeling sad or upset or whatever use use that that language but depressed has really become a, a pretty contaminated word and, these and, days. And viewers I agree with that because um, you know so many people talk about stress and depression and they're so common aren't they but um, uh, but there's so many people out there in the world who uh, who might not be suffering from depression but who've got very very bad mental states that's mm. right isn't it very bad mental states well, again, I think calling it a bad mental state has, has got some judgments in there that I, I'm not comfortable with. I agree. With. And, I agree. Um, How would you describe it then? Uh, are you saying uh, that uh, you could be the most positive person, but if, mm. if there's an event in your life which is a real trigger, you could then uh, commit, wish to commit suicide? Well, with hindsight, I can say that the, 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 the triggers that precipitated me feeling suicidal, um, they unleashed a sadness within me that I feel I've always had. Um, and, and to this day I still have. Uh, 
So it makes me sound like a fairly miserable sort of guy, but um, uh, but you're I'm very, not. You're very uh, awesome. But, but, but I'm not. And um, so I, and that's I don't know where that comes from, but it's, it's it's deep. It's always been with me, and a couple of times in my life, it's sort of overflowed and overwhelmed me. David, how many times have you tried to take your life? Well, it was back in '79, and then I got out of hospital, fell into university, did my first degree here at RMIT in computer science, worked in the computer industry for about a decade, um, and then I left uh, from working here at RMIT, and. Again, triggered by a relationship breakup that met, meant. So you, you met the, uh, you, you left the ex behind pr in, in the UK, which is probably a good thing. And you came here and, and met another lady. Yeah, well, uh, th that's nearly 15 years. So all, right. all, all, all sorts of things happened in that time. And, yes. Um, and met, had another relationship that when that fell apart, again, things I was overwhelmed by it. And on this occasion, instead of sort of immediately rushing to sort of suicide attempts and things. I, I, I phoned my sister and told her um, what was happening, how I was feeling, and she came around, and that was the beginning of what I now call my four years of madness. Four years of madness, and uh, uh, had you given up the heroin? Uh... Yeah, I hadn't used heroin for like 15 or 16 years. No. Yeah, hadn't touched it, hadn't been a part of my life at all. And where did your sister, did she give you some great advice? Uh, no, she just gave me some comfort, and she realised the seriousness of uh, what was happening. And I had by then already picked up the heroin. I was sort of a classic case of someone who self-medicated. Um, so in, in, in some ways it was easier for me to let go of it because my, my social world didn't revolve around it. it back during the 90s, I really was just self-medicating my pain with it. And look, I have to say, heroin's the only antidepressant that ever worked for me, but I do not advocate it as an antidepressant. Interesting. After the first suicide at, uh, attempt, when was the next one? Well, during that four years of madness, I actually spent quite a bit of time in the drug and alcohol circuit, the detoxes and rehabs, um, uh, a couple of times in the psychiatric ward. But towards the end there, I was just exhausted. And there were two serious suicide attempts. When you mean, sorry, for the viewers, when you say spent as a, uh, a patient or helping others? No, 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 as a patient. As a patient, so yeah. it was a pretty tough time for you? Yeah, it, but it wasn't entirely, I say, four years of madness. It wasn't four years of constant misery. Um, there were all sorts of good things that happened at that time of course. too. Including I lived at a yoga ashram for about eight months during Amazing. that period, which was great. I've practiced yoga for many years and it was a lovely refuge for me. But the problem was whenever I left and came back to Melbourne for the weekend, I just picked up the heroin again. It just happened straight away. And, and the second suicide attempt, same thing? Her her attempt a heroin overdose or...? Uh, there, there were two serious suicide attempts during those four years, just at the end. Yes. Uh, one was a heroin overdose that put me into hospital, where they revived me. Another one, by this stage I was on the methadone and all, and I had uh, uh, kept accumulated a stash of about 15 of my blockade dose levels of the methadone, which I took with some heroin and some whiskey, and, um, and that, that, that didn't work. The doctors that didn't work. don't we understand might why cut you short. Ladies and gents, we'll be back, back very shortly with uh, David Webb, a very amazing man. Don't go away. Welcome back to the show. I'm Michael Kazilny. I hope you're having a lovely time, whether you're having a happy time or a tough time. Remember, the time of the fire always makes us stronger and wiser. Uh, I used to be a warrior when I was a young policeman. I used to go to um, bank robberies and uh, fights and, uh, you know, um, violent people. But I, I started meditating about, I think, about 17 years ago, and I found uh, that the fear completely went away. Uh, meditation, I, I try to carve out one hour. Uh, every morning to meditate, just go into that silent space, viewers, and um, and it helps me just by uh, you almost become fearless. Uh, you become very fearless towards the opinions of other people. You become fearless towards death. And um, David, uh, you're telling me about the spiritual journey. Yep. Uh, it helped you a lot in your in your journey. Uh, it, it was the key to wanting to live again, and it's the key why I'm alive today. I believe. It's um, amazing. I talked about how the pieces started to come together and. Uh, it's, it, the, the key for me was when I realised that I was not who I think I am, that in fact um, my mind is part 
something that comes and goes, that arises and subsides. Would you say, life. David Webb, that you, that you know yourself now? Do you own yourself? Do you know exactly who you are? Uh, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty big statement, but I can say that in 1999, I, I feel I met myself fully for the first time uh, when I surrendered to that silence that you were just talking about, uh, the silence in which everything else arises. And so I s now see my, um, and, and in that silence, I found a peace, a deep peace, that I'd never before experienced in my life. Did you make friends with yourself? Uh, yeah, that's one way of saying it. But I, I met myself and I was okay. And, uh, uh, and I also realised that this peace that I found, or that I finally met, uh, had been there all along. And in fact, it was what I'd spent 44 years or whatever longing for, yearning for. And then I felt like a real dope, of course, because I also realised that this piece had always been there and I just overlooked it. Um, and but I didn't care. I could only laugh at myself for being such a dope for so many years. I was just so, so happy to be actually be wanting to, to live again. Isn't that amazing, viewers? And so many people uh, uh, you know, love to uh, be involved in the crowd. And I think the best um, thing in life you can do is be an individual. And, um, and in Buddhism, Buddhism, there's an old saying, the roar of the lion. When you get to a stage in meditation, when you realise that you're completely independent to the good opinion of other people, then it's such a blissful state. You know, there's always going to be the backstabbers and uh, people whinging or complaining. People aren't going to all love you. So if you get to that stage where you just say, well, if you're comfortable with love, come to me. But uh, you, f you can forget about all the backstabbing and um, the people who don't agree with your opinion. So I'm, I'm glad I've come to that stage because in the legal profession, it's certainly um, uh, very important to be, uh, I call it spiritually resistant, uh, to almost have a bulletproof um, spirituality. I don't think I've got that bulletproof spirituality that uh, y you need for your, your line of work. But uh, it, it has a, the other word that I use with the piece is freedom, because freedom. in that piece, there's this tremendous freedom. And for me, it's the freedom to just be me, and that's sort of nothing more, but nothing less. And it also gives me the freedom to do the work that I do these days. I mean, first of all, I went and did a PhD, but I've also got very involved in mental health human rights. It, it, again, going tracing back to a PhD in suicide. I've never heard of that. What do you well, study? Well, my PhD was a, a little unorthodox, to say the least. It was not mainstream suicidology. What I tried to do was to um, work with my story, and I guess I set it up uh, side by side with what the prevailing mainstream thinking is about suicide and suicide prevention. And when you look at my story and you look at what the experts are saying, there's some pretty big gaps. And viewers, uh, David Webb's the, uh, the author of uh, Thinking About Suicide. Um, it's uh, out on the UK and uh, hopefully we'll get that, uh, get a, find a good publisher for him here in Australia. But um, you're obviously very, very serious about this subject. And what's your view? How does it uh, differentiate to, uh, you call it the circus, the mental health Mental circus. There's a chapter in the book called The Mental Illness Circus and uh, like I said I spent a fair bit of time in the drug and alcohol uh, rehab sector but also some a fair bit of time um, under psychiatric treatment including being locked up once and some of the basically what's on offer was most of the time unhelpful and a couple of times really quite harmful made things worse and I don't accept the prevailing view is that depression is the major cause of suicide. We hear that regularly. I think that's what many people think. But in fact, there's no scientific evidence for that statement whatsoever. It is just a medical assumption that there must be some medical biological basis for this. But there's no evidence to support that. What's your view? I describe, I say the best way to begin to try and understand suicide is to think about it, conceptualise it as a crisis of the self. And in some cases, such as myself, that crisis is a spiritual crisis. Now I'm not generalising and I certainly am not advocating spirituality as some um, you know, universal panacea, no. but for some people, such as myself, it was really the key to, between wanting to live and not wanting to live. Yes. And if you look at the medical experts, they're not even capable of engaging in conversation around suicide, uh, spiritual values, spiritual needs. Um, it's virtually uh, forbidden within their professional 
practice. Well, he's got a good point, viewers. Uh, you know, uh, Western society, we're very much into uh, fixed formulas. Uh, as soon as you get out of that fixed formula, people look at you differently, you know. I mean, uh, I, I sometimes go to court and say, I've worked with my client and um, he has started meditating for the last three months uh, and he's feeling a lot more confident about himself. And, uh, you know, some of the people just look at me and laugh. But I spoke to a, a, a great fellow, uh, a Dr. Michael King, uh, only last week, who's a magistrate in um, Perth. And uh, he's been using uh, meditation and sentencing for many, many years and uh, has found some uh, amazing results. So I think it's all, in all professions. As soon as, we, uh, as we're an individual and we, we go outside the crowd, people try to pull you down, don't they? They don't want to listen. Yeah, and I, I say that the biggest obstacle uh, in making progress with suicide prevention is the current medicalisation of it. Yes. And uh, because if we say depression is the cause of suicide, then we stop looking for the real reasons. Uh, it's, it, it would be nice if it was true, if we could just say that there's this medical condition that causes this, but you, we, we really shouldn't be saying that without some evidence to support so that. So you're saying any uh, a person uh, who goes through a a major personal crisis could end up attempting suicide. Uh, is that, am I getting it right or well, is it a spiritual crisis? Well it was for me but I don't say that it's necessarily for others. No. For some people they b want to be able to just return back to some previous time in their life where things were going well and that's perfectly fine. I've met people for whom that's what they needed and what they did. But for me there was nothing in my past that I wanted to return to. For me it was, um, it was like a personal transformation into some new We'll talk about that transformation territory. very shortly. Thank you very much for watching Tough Times. We're on the couch with David Webb. We'll be back shortly. Welcome back to uh, the show. I'm Michael Kazilny and I hope you're having a lovely Wednesday evening. Uh, if you're going through a tough time, and I'm sure there's many Australians going through a tough time at the moment, uh, spoil yourself and have a bit of fun this week because uh, I know a lot of Australians are going through uh, divorce. You know, they don't get to see their children. Others are going through depression. Others are contemplating suicide. Others might be uh, having uh, difficulty with their finances or having a tough time at work. But remember, tough times never last, but tough people do. Here's a perfect example, David Webb, he's uh, attempted suicide a couple of times, uh, he's uh, had a heroin habit, but he's turned, turned his life around completely in many years, and you've done so many great things with your life. Um, how do you help others now? I mean, this book is amazing, not many people write a book and put everything in there, but you certainly have. The book is, it was such a delight to finally see this book, because that was part of my PhD, which I finished about four or five years ago. Um, but my work these days is really to do with mental health human rights. Yes. And you talk about tough times. I feel like I'm travelling pretty well these days. I'm pretty fortunate. Yes. But I'm acutely aware that there are many people who are having uh, mental health difficulties and the response of Australian society is actually pretty brutal. Um, I th I'm of the view that we really need to put an end to um, psychiatric force as the basis of our mental health system. Uh, and, th and when I say that, it's not just those people that are made involuntary patients. The, 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 the threat of force poisons everything about our mental health system. So much so that you know, many people who have ever had contact with our mental health system now will do whatever they can to avoid having uh, contact with it again. I, I certainly live in fear of our mental health laws as I know, and I know many people do. And so it, we're in the ridiculous situation that the system is, that is meant to help people at times of crisis is in fact being actively avoided by those people because of fear of getting locked up, fear of being drugged against their wishes. Right, that, that's interesting. And, and uh, David, there'd be a, a quite a few people watching who are secretly uh, contemplating on ending their lives, mm. but they some have just toyed with the ideas mm. and I, I've sp I speak to them every day, mm. even people who are facing court cases. I, you know, I've mm. spoken five last week mm. who, um, there was one chap who, uh, who's built up a successful business and he's got kids and everything and there was a sexual offence when he was 14 years of age mm. and uh, he's thinking of taking his life. Mm. But what do you say to people like that who are contemplating uh, ending their lives? Yeah, look, the first thing I say is um, 
to, to, to respect those feelings, to treat them with some honour. Um, you know, our, our, our knee-jerk response is to be frightened and panic and, you know, and, and just try and suppress it, put a lid on it. And I think that really works and at times it can make things worse. So like, you know, when the, pop, the lid does finally pop, it pops big time. Yes. So we, we need to change our attitudes towards people who are struggling with suicidal thoughts. Mm. And it begins with respecting them as legitimate, real, significant, and I would say sacred uh, feelings. Um, now, when I say that, I have to also say, but try to resist the urge to act on those feelings. Mm. And there's a space, and this is almost a spiritual idea, but I don't want to overemphasise the spiritual, but there is a space between suppressing your feelings and acting upon them. And if you can spend time in that space, then you, you and engage with these very significant feelings that you're having, then that can be a place where you be, can begin to find a way out of them. It can be a space where healing can begin. But to just society's reaction, which is just one of fear and panic, um, to suppress and control and contain the person, uh, pushes us underground. It's, it's not a good place to be when you... No, that's right view, isn't it? F fear is a bad thing, isn't it? We're all scared of something. We're scared about being unemployed, not being able to provide our families, um, fear of death, fear of disease. But um, yeah, I always think in a hundred years from now, every person on this planet will be wiped out and, uh, and death is going to come and wipe us all out. It's a certainty. Uh, so I always think uh, just... Uh, Life is just made up of beautiful moments. Uh, we're here to love and be loved. And at the end of the day, we're all gonna die, whether it's next week, next month, in five years or 10 years. And just think in 240 months, you'll be 20 years older. So I think uh, we should really try to make the most of each day, shouldn't we? Well, what you just said there reminded me that, well, first of all, my book calls for a broad community conversation of this, to bring it out of the closet as a public health issue. And we've got to begin that conversation. We're not very good at it. And the reason we're not very good at it is because two of our greatest fears come together in suicide, our fear of death and our fear of madness. And we're not good at talking about either of them. No. So we, we really need to open this up and, and try and have a very careful conversation about it and bring it uh, into the community. It's, it's not a conversation that can be left solely to the experts. I totally agree. Mm. I totally agree. And I also am very, very impressed with somebody who can uh, share their life journey because a lot of people, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in Western society are very closed book, aren't they? They're, you know, it's a very uh, fake uh, society, really. You know, we greet people at work. How are you, Fred? I'm good. And how are you? And how's the holidays? But really, really, do we share uh, the tough times or how we really feel? Uh, it wouldn't be nice if we just um, became a lot more authentic and told people how we feel, uh, you know, even about some of the stuff in the past. But people uh, are very closed, aren't they? They only want to broadcast good news and they read books like Anthony Robbins, you know, The Power of Positive Thinking. <laughs> yep. But really, we should I think it's beautiful to experience all the emotions of life. Mm. Mm, we absolutely. can't be happy all the time because we all, it's up and down like a prostitute's pants, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, isn't you, it? you referred to Buddhism before, and my spirituality is not Buddhist, but it's got lots of parallels, I think. And, yes. And, and, you know, the Buddha came up to his conclusions through his own suffering. And, you know, suffering is a part of life. Uh, our, our culture doesn't like that. We will do everything to avoid suffering, but it's a part of life. And I think life is more rich if you engage meaningfully, more meaningfully with your suffering. There are great lessons to be learned Indeed. from it. And so in fact, I say these days that I'm grateful for my suicidality because without it, I wouldn't be where I am today. And I'm very happy to be where I am today. I totally agree that the tough times do teach us something. Mm -hmm. And I always wake up every day and say that everything that happens in our lives happens for our maximum benefit. David Webb, God bless you. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that journey. We'll have you in again. <laughs> this is the book, Thinking About Suicide. Uh, but thank you very much for watching. And uh, if you're going through a tough time, remember tough times never last, but tough people do. And you're one of those tough people. God bless you. Love and best wishes. And we'll see you next Wednesday. Good night.